in the Philippines, we often took a, a time out to go up into the mountains where it was a lot cooler, up into uh, Baguio City. I'm sure uh, Rose remembers uh, Baguio City. It's a nice, lovely place, a tourist spot, and uh, certainly a lot cooler than down in the, in the lowlands. And travelling by bus up that switchback mountain, uh, all of the roads going backwards and forwards because of the climbing up, uh, it was just fascinating to see terraces of rice carved out of the hillside. And the most famous of all of these are the rice terraces of Banawe, because they are so extensive. Why are they there? Well, they're designed to keep hold of the rainwater. And when it rains in the Philippines, it pours. And uh, again, in the old days, the rain would have run down the mountainsides and settled in the valleys. The water then would uh, t totally change the ground in the valleys. Everything would grow. But on the hillsides, it would be barren still. It would be dry. And the reason is that the mountains received no benefit for the rain, even though it poured long and hard. And so these terraces were built in order to stop the water running down the hills. And uh, therefore, now that there was water there to be uh, used, they held that water and it became a, a really nice uh, rice planting area. And in James chapter 1, he's given us really three ways in which we can see if our faith is genuine. And we've already seen the first two through our response to trials and our response to temptation. And the third way is our response to the Word of God. And when we read or hear the Word of God, it's as if the Word of God is sending that life-giving rain down upon us. And the prophet Isaiah uses a very similar image, doesn't he, when he says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. So how do we respond to this rain from heaven, this word of God? Does it just run off us or do we keep hold of it and let it produce fruit in our lives, that fruit of the spirit that we've been thinking a lot about? And the word of God is vital to our spiritual life and to growth. Firstly then, just put up the PowerPoint, please. Okay. So the way to life is through receiving the word of God, verses 16 to 21. And James doesn't want people to be deceived into thinking that they are Christians when they are not. And genuine faith results in life and growth, even through trials and temptations. And we saw last week how, at times, we fail to live up to our calling. But God is not to blame for our failures. He does not lead us into sin for it. It's against his nature to do so. He himself cannot be tempted by evil, and neither does he tempt anyone. And God is altogether good, and he's holy, and all that he gives is good and perfect. And so verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And here is we notice that he's called the Father of lights. In other words, he's the source of all light, both natural and spiritual. And the Apostle John says that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And that only really serves to emphasize the goodness and the holiness and the purity of God. Furthermore, he is faithful, he is consistent, he is unchanging, and therefore we can completely trust him and his word. Other created lights, such as the sun, the moon, and the stars, they may change, but not God. And the sun may vary in intensity, from morning to noon to dusk. The turning of the earth and the sun produces shifting shadows as the day is now lengthened and now shortened. Eclipses of the sun and moon, they cast shadows on vast parts of the earth. But in contrast, God changes not. And this is the God who gives and gives and goes on giving. A God who is good, who is holy, pure, faithful, consistent 
and unchanging. And the effects of sin following temptation is death, spiritual death and separation from God. But in contrast, the giver of all good and perfect gifts brings us to birth and life through his word, the truth. And of his own will, it says in verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by that word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, in our multi-faith society, we hear uh, words from all sorts of men and women, from Buddha, from Mohammed, from Confucius, from Joseph Smith, Mary Eddie Baker, Richard Dawkins, and many, many more. But in the teachings of the Bible, we have the infallible word of truth, because it alone is the word of God. And here the teachings come not from man, but from God himself, who is faithful and unchanging. And they are his revelation to a fallen world, bringing gospel truth. And so they tell of his character, full of love, justice and holiness. They tell of his power, creator of heaven and earth. And they tell of his passion to reconcile sinful people like you and me to himself. And they tell of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to seek and to save the lost. And they tell us of our need of repentance and faith towards God so that we might be saved and share in his life. And by hearing this word and through the working of the Holy Spirit of God, men and women are brought to faith in Christ Jesus, just like Jack and Holly this morning. Romans 10, 17, the Apostle Paul says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In other words, the word about Christ. But we need to take note of how we listen to the word. Verse 19 and 20. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And while this is good advice in a general sense, and don't we wish that it would be true for many people, while it's true in a general sense, yet the context requires us to apply it specifically to our hearing of the Word of God. And whenever we hear the Word of God, we should be quick. We should be eager to listen to its message. And this is the Word that brings life and enables us to grow in faith. So let that word be our delight. Let's really be eager to listen to it, engage with it. But let our conduct show that we have this new life within and not just be empty words. James will teach further on the sins of the tongue later on in this letter. For now we note that it is uh, so easy to talk the talk but not to walk the walk. Be slow to speak and make great claims for yourself. All that we are as children of God, all that we have as believers in Christ, is all received from our Father in heaven, who knows how to give good and perfect gifts. And it's all of God's grace. All that we are able to accomplish for God is not something that we can boast about, for it is God that has done the work in us and through us. And so, again, it's all of God's grace. Rather, practice what you preach so that others may know that your faith is genuine. Be slow to anger as well, for the word of God can rebuke us. And if we refuse to listen, then we will not change and live that life that is right in God's sight. Uncontrolled anger is the second sin that we read of in the Bible. You remember way back in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 7. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, 
Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And there, of course, is a righteous anger which we see in the way that God responds to sin. That anger that we saw of Jesus in the temple as he cast out all of those that abused that space, that holy space. But often anger rises in us and we're mastered by it rather than becoming masters of it. And if we're slow to anger and let the word of truth guide us, then unrighteous anger will be mastered and righteous anger will be exercised in accordance with God's will. So having heard the word of God, it must also be received. And Jesus told the parable, didn't he, of the man who went out to sow in his field. It's such a a familiar parable to us. And that seed fell in different places, on the path, on rocky ground, amongst the thorns and the thistles, as well as on that good soil. And the seed brought no fruit except on that good soil. And Jesus likened it to the planting of the word of God in our lives. The good soil is like that person who receives the truth of the word and holds onto it with joy. And the result is the same as that of rain on the rice terraces. It produces a spiritual harvest just as God intended it. The first fruits of the harvest are those which are especially set apart for God. And so too, every believer has been set apart to live for Christ and reflect God's character. Can you say then, without a doubt, that you have been born again by the Spirit of God? That's what we were thinking about this morning. Have you been born again by the Spirit of God through this very word of truth? And if Christ lives in you, then you will know that inner witness of the Holy Spirit, the one that tells us that we are truly children of God. And any newborn child should grow and give evidence of the life that is within, a life of blessing. And so verse 21 says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, as we saw last week, James is writing to those who have already turned their backs on the past with all of the wrongs that they have committed, who have turned in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and received the word of truth, the gospel, as God's call to come and follow him. They have received salvation, the new birth, and the beginning of a new life has begun with Christ. But for James, genuine salvation must result in a changed life. Faith without works is dead, and he's going to say that later on in this letter. And he develops that theme. But he's not saying, put your life in order, and you will be saved. He is saying that once we have been saved or spiritually born again by the word of truth, that implanted word will bring a new vitality in our struggle against temptation and sin. And having been saved from the penalty of sin through faith in the message of Christ, we are to be daily saved from the power of sin as the Holy Spirit empowers us to live according to the word of God. And in the same way that we put off our clothes, perhaps in the evening, to put on another set of clothes, we are to put off all filthiness. And in our spiritually unborn state, we view sin very differently but now that we have been born by the word of truth that same truth should mold our consciences so that we see sin for what it really is as filthy in God's sight no longer can we say well everyone does it or it's generally accepted by people so it must be okay the word of God is now our pattern and the spirit of God our enabler to put off the sin that so easily entangles us. And in his work of sanctifying us and of purifying us, the Holy Spirit graciously deals with the baggage that we bring with us from our past way of life, little by little. That's his ministry of sanctification, isn't it? That phrase, rampant rampant wickedness, probably means the last traces of wickedness. 
It's like the word used when the disciples picked up every last crumb that was left over after the feeding of the 4,000 in Mark chapter 8 and verse 8. And uh, in the Spirit's strength, we are therefore to remove all of those last crumbs of sin in our lives. And such an attitude towards sin reflects our attitude to the Word of God. We are to receive this Word implanted in our hearts humbly. And when we come to the Word of God, we are to come in a submissive way, ready to bring every area of our life under its sway, under its transforming power. And so as we are saved from the power of sin and sanctified by the Spirit, we will finally be saved from the presence of sin when we are taken up to glory with Christ. Well, I think some of us may say hallelujah to that. So then secondly, if I get this right. Yep, gone too far, have I? There we go. The way to blessing is through keeping the word of God, verses 22 to 27. Now, this week, Boris Johnson has urged countries in the United Nations to commit to major changes on climate change, hasn't he? And they've heard this plea, but will they fulfil their pledges? That's the big question. And that's the Christian that faces us, a Christian in similar situations, when James asks us the same sort of question. Verse 22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And mere listening to the the word of truth, the word of God, it's no evidence of life within. Can it possibly be that we come Sunday by Sunday to hear the word of God, but it is nothing more than rain rushing down the hillside, bringing no benefit to the hearer? Well, sadly, it can be. Indeed, the word of God tells us that it will be so in some people's lives. And wherever the word of God is preached, there will be many who hear it, but who don't keep it. And in this they deceive themselves, or rather, as the word implies, they excuse themselves. It's all too easy to make excuses for sidestepping our obligations to keep the word of God. Perhaps we're happy to see its application to somebody else in the congregation. Yes, that's really good for her or for him and yet make excuses when it hits home to me. And sometimes we may excuse ourselves by claiming that this part of Scripture is outdated. It's all right for a primitive people, but aren't we civilised now? And we've moved on since then. Well, in some cases this may be true, but we need to be careful not to use this to excuse ourselves from obedience to God's clear commands. Or maybe we claim that the circumstances are different. People and, uh, sorry, the circumstances are different. Nowadays, some things that used to be unacceptable have become commonplace. So again, we think of all that's going on in in our world at the moment. The attitude towards abortion, towards euthanasia, living with a partner, same-sex relationships. All of these things have now become generally acceptable. Or maybe we claim that this scripture is only for really bad people and not for decent little me. But excuses will not get us off the hook, for the word of God is like a mirror, verses 23 to 24. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Well, actually, the Word of God is more than a mirror. A mirror shows us what we are now, and so too does the Word of God. But the Word of God also shows us the Saviour and what we are to become. And when we look in a mirror and we see that our hair is a mess, then the very fact that we have looked into the mirror leaves us without an excuse if we don't brush it. Interestingly, the literal translation of this part of verse 23 is a man who looks at the face of his birth. When we are born, we have a baby face, but we don't want to keep it for long. A 25-year-old would be very upset to be called baby face. We expect growth, don't we? 
And when we're given spiritual birth through the word of truth, there is nothing wrong with being a baby-faced Christian at that point. But we expect to grow and show evidence of new life within. And that's why the scriptures points us towards the mature pattern that Jesus himself has left us. We're to become like him. We will become mature like him as we receive this teaching, not merely from our parents, but the teaching of the word of God, and we keep it or act on what it says. So verse 25, But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. And here is a man who means business with God. He is somebody who is not going to forget what he has heard or make excuses for himself. He looks intently into that law, that perfect law of liberty. And that intense looking is the same as that of John the disciple on arriving at the empty tomb of Jesus. He didn't just give a casual look, but rather a searching look, an investigative look into the tomb. And looking at every detail, yes, the grave clothes were still there. Uh, the, the whole thing was as if the body had just lifted out of it without actually moving it from the place that it was left when he was there. The head capped slightly apart from the rest as expected, but the body was gone. And so a casual glance might have led to the conclusion that somebody had stolen the body. But a searching look convinced John that the Lord had indeed risen from the dead and he believed. And so too our listening to the word of God must be earnest and yield an active response from us. Notice too that James now calls the life-giving word of truth the perfect law. The word of God is not only absolute truth, it is absolute perfection and it guides us in the right way. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, a very wonderful passage talking about the word of God. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. And moreover by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. And this perfect law is marvellous. And to all these blessings, James adds that of freedom, of liberty, and Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And this word of truth not only tells us to shake off the old ways, but it actually sets us free from them, so that we can walk in newness of life, in his power, in his strength. So hallelujah to that. Praise the Lord for all that he does for us. We're then without excuse if we don't take heed. We are without excuse if we don't take heed. And rather we are to continue in the word of God, to keep closely to it, so that it might be a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. We are to read it and to meditate on it day and night. And as we discover new truths and teachings, we are to act on them straight away. The blessing comes in the doing, not in the mere listening. And in this way, faith is seen to be genuine. The way to blessing is through keeping the word of God, acting on it. How then can we know that our faith is genuine? Well, by our response to the trials, by our response to the temptations, but here by our response to the word of God. Firstly, we must hear it. Secondly, we must receive it. And thirdly, we must keep it. Verses 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. 
religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Outwardly, we may appear to be very religious and even consider ourselves to be so. We go to church, we sing in the choir, we pray each night, we know our Bibles. But if our hearts are not changed, then these things are meaningless. We only deceive ourselves. It's out of the heart that come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, etc., as Matthew tells us. But the previous verse says, but the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. The words you speak comes from the heart, and that's what defiles you. And our tongues will soon reveal what is in our hearts. And James will deal again, as I said, with this later on in chapter 3, where he says, with it the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. A man boasts of his works and he speaks ill of others. He backbites them. He hurts their, ne- their names and their characters by private insinuation, insinuations, by public charges without any foundation. He takes no care of what he says but gives his tongue unbridled rein to speak anything to the injury of others and the dishonour of God. Such a man's faith is not genuine, for if it were, he would guard his lips and be remorseful for anything he says that unjustly hurts others. So watch your tongue. And rather, what God is looking for as evidence of changed lives is a work of grace in our hearts, such that we genuinely care for the vulnerable and care about our personal purity. Throughout the Old Testament, God is the one who is a defender of the fatherless and the widows. And true religion reflects this as we seek to care for people in distress. And we only have to think of people down our street, in our village, in our families, in our places of work, to realise that there are so many who are in distress today. And what is the cause? Well, John Blanchard says, perhaps it is the pressure of a large family or a low income, the pressure of chronic illness or sudden bereavement, the pressure of unkind discrimination or a fractured relationship, the pressure of mental illness or unemployment. And so think of the people around us. Are we doing all we can to care for them in their distress? And again, it reminds us of the parable of the Good Samaritan, which Jesus told to illustrate the second great commandment to love our neighbour as ourselves. The first great commandment, of course, is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. And we can do that as we keep ourselves from being polluted by the word. The world here refers to that man-centred system which lives in rebellion against God. It's characterised by its immorality, its dishonesty, its greed, its selfishness, its violence, its envy, its arrogance, its blasphemy, its cruelty, its materialism, its obsession with pleasure, and above all, its careless or calculated rejection of God. Just uh, last night, as uh, Val and I went out for a meal down in Portsmouth, a particular place where we went to eat, Lots and lots of young people all over the place. And that describes those people. To see that all just out in force, the immorality, the dishonesty, the greed, the selfishness, all of those things were on show. And they're on show today in the world. If we are to reject the world's standards, repulse its lies, resist its temptations and repel its pressures then we will need to be fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, to be filled with his spirit. And as we rely upon him and prayerfully seek his enabling, we will reflect that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. And we will embody that righteous life that God desires. And such a life has been transformed from the heart 
outwards. Such a life shows that our faith is genuine and God is at work in us, making us more like him. During a mid-year day of prayer, I was struck by the following quote. Our gospel responsibility demands purity in the hidden life, integrity in the public life, and clarity in presenting God's word. How do we respond to the word of God? Is it rain settling on our lives and producing fruit for the glory of God? Or is it running straight over us with never a chance to bring life? Congregations never honour God more than when they reverently listen to his word, intending not just to hear, but to obey in response to what he has done, is doing, and will do for them. Words from Jeff Thomas. Just read that again. Congregations never honour God more than when they reverently listen to his word, intending not just to hear, but to obey in response to what he has done, is doing, and will do for them. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as I come to these words, I find them such a challenge to my own life. And Lord, humbly confess that need of your indwelling, that need of your empowering, that need of the Holy Spirit to work in me that which I cannot do of myself. And Lord, I think probably we would all agree that that's our own story. These things are hard to talk about, hard to think about. And yet we do pray that you will continue to confirm in us that work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you will change us, transform us, renew us. Praying that you will help us, Lord, to surrender to you, that we may day by day be walking close to you, that we'll be living out the life of the Spirit as we seek to keep that word that you have given to us. Lord, transform us, we pray. Transform us as a church, Lord, that we might more and more give glory to you. And we pray that as we give glory to you, that others may see, that Jesus may be exalted and glorified, that he may be lifted up, and Lord, that he will become everything. And that again, Lord, is why we should be so intense, why we should be so focused on Jesus. We do pray that we may, in this coming week, be those who meditate upon your word. And Lord, as we meditate, may we not just be hearers only, but doers also, fulfilling your perfect plan in the power of your Holy Spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen.